Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So if you guys remember seeing A New Hope, the duel between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi is a little bit lackluster, especially by today's Hollywood standards. But back then, there weren't complicated harness wire systems or CGI, and on top of that, Al Guinness was 63 when they filmed The New Hope, so he couldn't exactly move around very quickly. This gives us the perception that Obi-Wan Kenobi is clearly outmatched by Darth Vader. But after watching him take on Maul in the Rebels cartoon series, I think that's far from the truth. And action. Your power is a weak old man. You should not come back. You can't win, Darth. If my blade should find its mark, you will cease to exist. During his exile, Obi-Wan had two major tasks. The first one was watching over Luke Skywalker, the second one was assigned to him by Yoda. Qui-Gon Jinn had contacted him as a Force Spirit, and Yoda wanted to teach Obi-Wan how to communicate with him. It's a very complicated process which probably deserves its own video, but to summarize, very few Jedi could obtain this state. And only the most powerful Force users were able to become one with the Force. A lot of people argue that Obi-Wan was just sitting around contemplating about the Force and meditating while he was on Tatooine. And because he wasn't constantly doing physical training and lightsaber sparring, he was way too out of shape to go up against someone like Darth Vader. That's not how the Force works. Thanks, Solo. Lightsaber duels are relatively different from conventional sparring, and although non-Force users can technically learn some of the more basic Jedi forms, true lightsaber combat happens so quickly that combatants must instinctively use the Force to parry and strike. Which is why us normal folks don't really stand much of a chance against them. Our reaction time just isn't fast enough. At the same time, they can predict every one of our movements. This is why Jedi and Sith both use forms. They practice complex lightsaber combos over and over again until it becomes second nature. Because there's no time to think during a lightsaber duel. One must give themselves fully into the force and rely on their instincts, muscle memory, and training. Duelists like Mace Windu were exceptionally dangerous because they were able to master several forms and switch in mid-combo to different forms, making him extremely unpredictable. We're gonna seal off this Anakin was also unpredictable. And Obi-Wan's connection to the Force was masterful. In Twin Suns, he takes Maul apart in just three moves. Obi-Wan was able to best Maul in the past, but this was due to Darth Maul's overconfidence after killing a master swordsman like Qui-Gon Jinn. He let his guard down and let the Padawan surprise him. But through the Clone Wars, Obi-Wan had a great deal of trouble dueling Darth Maul. So what changed in all those years? Darth Maul was still a very dangerous duelist. He had easily taken on three Inquisitors at the same time shortly before his encounter with Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. But Obi-Wan's connection with the Force was so strong that he was able to telegraph every one of Darth Maul's moves and he knew exactly when to strike. He used many different lightsaber forms, but he mastered Form 3 or Sarisu, the way of the Minoc. It was originally created to defend against blaster bolts, but it was also a terrific defensive form. An individual properly trained in Form 3 could hold off a superior swordsman for an extended amount of time. This was because this form focused on extremely efficient footwork and sword placement. It was designed to provide maximum coverage and tire out opponents. And as the other duelists got tired, the Minot counterattacks. Paired with the dual saber, this form was practically impenetrable. Although some Sith did use this form, Sarisu was the embodiment of Jedi philosophy. It was about defense, tranquility, and patience, and Obi-Wan's training in the Force made his form that much deadlier. Another argument people sometimes make is that Obi-Wan Kenobi is too old at the time of A New Hope. But that's also a flawed argument because Kenobi is only 57. I used to train with a guy named Ron Lipton. He was once Muhammad Ali's sparring partner and retired to be a referee. I held the heavy bag once while he was punching it. It felt like I was getting hit in the shoulder continuously by a car. He was 71 years old. And in Star Wars, humans have a much longer lifespan, especially Force users. I mean, look at Count Dooku. He was 83 when he lost his head. So Obi-Wan Kenobi at 57 was still pretty close to being in top form. Al Guinness was 63 at the time of the filming, and back then, 63 was considered old. But nowadays, being in your 60s doesn't really mean you can't kick ass. Anakin Skywalker, on the other hand, was a pure powerhouse. His transition to Darth Vader changed his dueling style. 
His stiff suit made more agile moves almost impossible. So Anakin fought with a modified form five lightsaber technique that used his overwhelming strength and the weight of his suit to overpower his enemies. So this duel is about power attacks and tranquil defense, and this is clearly reflected in the fighters and their state of mind. I think there's a small chance that Obi-Wan could have defeated Anakin. Darth Vader was obviously underestimating Obi-Wan during the confrontation. Your power is a weak old man. Obi-Wan would have to rely on towering out Anakin and waiting for him to make a mistake. But he also realized that he was surrounded by Imperial troops, and even if he managed to kill Darth Vader, he still has to somehow make it off the Death Star. So he did the grown-up thing, and made a sacrifice so the rest of the team could escape. Besides, defeating Vader is not the point of A New Hope. Obi-Wan knows his purpose is to mentor and guide Luke Skywalker. He made a quick decision. He realized by martyring himself, he could not only save Luke, but he also teaches him a valuable lesson about the sacrifices one needed to make for the greater good. On top of that, he had prepared the whole Jedi ghost thing as a backup, so it wasn't like he was going to leave Luke all by himself. And to be honest, if you spent almost two entire decades meditating in the desert to transcend the physical world to become a force being, once you kind of want to see what it'd be like when it finally does happen. And yes, Vader did kill Obi-Wan. Whether he disappeared before the blade hit or not doesn't really matter. That's just semantics or maybe special effects limitations. The idea is he is responsible for Obi-Wan's death. Well, that's our theory, guys, and I know it's not very definitive, but the point I want to really make here is that Obi-Wan Kenobi was not as weak as he appeared in the movie. I think he very much was capable of holding his ground against Darth Vader. And holding his own. I think he was mostly very capable. A few episodes ago, we asked if you thought Vader knew about his children. 70 of you said he had no idea. 23 of you said, I ain't the baby's daddy, and probably used to watch Maury. 19 of you said, I have a son. 15 of you said, those twins. And just one of you said I have a daughter. Sorry, Leia. In today's poll, I want to ask you guys the obvious question. Who do you think would win in a straight fight between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi? Just hit the small button on the top right corner and select the answer you think is right, and we'll let you know in one of our next episodes the results. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining us today, and if you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.